Okay, timer is going because I have a problem with that. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Saffitz. Welcome to my home kitchen. Today I have a recipe for you that is a classic of New York City Jewish bakeries, an iconic baked good. This is a black and white cookie. I actually have a version in my book, What's for Dessert, that is a blue and white cookie. But today I'm just doing a modified version that is the classic black and white. It's basically a cakey cookie with this delicious kind of fondant icing. It's sweet, it's delicious, it's a black and white cookie. Black and white cookie, I don't specifically know the origins of it, but for decades, possibly even a century, it has been kind of a classic baked good in the like Jewish New York baking tradition. The classic iconic Russ and Daughters has a black and white cookie, or washers, but that's also kind of a thing that's so ubiquitous in New York. It's like every bodega has a black and white cookie individually wrapped in plastic. They're not that good when they come from the bodega because there's something that's stale very, very quickly. So to me, the best black and white cookie you're probably gonna eat, especially if you don't live in New York, is the one you make at home. It's a little bit of a misnomer because it's as much cake as it is cookie. It's basically like a very stiff cake batter that you bake and it kind of spreads out on the baking sheet and you turn it over and you ice the flat side. So you end up with this kind of slightly domed, really cakey, delicious, sort of light cookie. Is it cake or is it cookie? It's kind of both. I decided to do a version in what's for dessert that is blue and white, named for the blueberry half. So this is like half blueberry icing, half vanilla, and then the whole thing has lemon juice and lemon zest in it. So to me, this is like a fruit forward take on the black and white cookie. But today I just really wanted to show you the classic. It's really fun. I've really been talking for a long time about the black and white cookie. The caffeine, you know, it's kicked in. <laughs> Very straightforward. I know I always say that, but just kind of some pantry staples. I have all purpose flour, two large eggs, baking soda, kosher salt, baking powder, buttermilk, granulated sugar, room temp butter, and vanilla extract. For the fondant or the icing, I have confectioner sugar, two tablespoons light corn syrup, two tablespoons milk, two tablespoons unsweetened cocoa powder, and I'm also gonna add some vanilla and some boiling water, which I don't have out at the moment. The only special equipment you'll need is a hand mixer. You could very easily do it in a stand mixer. Either one is fine. So I have that right here, and then you'll just need some rim baking sheets for baking the cookies. The scoop is not required, but it is recommended. I didn't get the scoop. Ah, uh, the scoop. Should I get a shot of the scoop? When you look at your arm, it's kind of like a red and white cookie. That's so mean. It's really here is really bad. It's really bad. Does it look like I'm wearing red sleeves? That's what said. <laughs> Does it look like that? No. Can you I color correct know. that? Let's start on the cookie dough cake batter. It's really cake batter, truly. So I'm just gonna call it that. So I'm gonna mix my dry ingredients. I have my all purpose flour. This is two cups. Then I have my baking soda, baking powder, half teaspoon of each, and then my kosher salt. I'm gonna preheat my oven to 350. So I'm gonna set that over here. Now I'm going to start by creaming together my butter and sugar. So this is how any cake or cookie recipe starts pretty much. This is room temp butter. It's a stick and a half or 12 tablespoons, six ounces. Now the optimal butter temperature for creaming butter and sugar it's sort of cool room temperature, like 68 degrees, because at that temperature it's spreadable and malleable, but it's not so warm that it's starting to get like a little greasy. Like that's the temperature at which it holds air the best. So then I'm gonna add my sugar. I have a cup of granulated sugar. I normally make sort of less sweet desserts. I don't wanna say unsweet because they're all, they all have a certain amount of sweetness. This is on the sweeter end, but having that chocolate in the icing helps to kind of balance everything out. There's just no way around sweet fondant, you know? It's made of sugar. Using my hand mixer, I'm gonna cream all of this together. So basically I wanna beat this. The sugar is gonna cut into the butter and make lots of little tiny air pockets. So this will become sort of light and fluffy. 
I also have all of my other ingredients at room temperature. The buttermilk has been sitting out of the fridge for a couple hours. The eggs have been out for a few hours. So it's important when you're making any kind of cake or cookie recipe that you want everything to be the exact same temp. So I'm just gonna pause to scrape down the sides of the bowl. It's become quite pale and it's starting to become really fluffy. I'm probably halfway there. When you're using a, a hand mixer, that creaming usually takes a little bit longer than it does in a stand mixer. So in a stand mixer, if you're using the paddle, which I would use at this point, this could take you with this quantity of butter and sugar, maybe two or three minutes. In a hand mixer, it's more like four. So I'm gonna keep going. I have it on medium high. This is just to help create like a really light texture. How much vanilla? Two teaspoons vanilla. Okay, I think this looks good. It's definitely gained quite a bit in volume and it's like super light and fluffy. So now I'm gonna add the eggs. If my eggs were cold or at least colder than the butter, what would happen is I would add those eggs and it would cause the butter to like harden and it would just really lose this like super smooth texture. So by having the eggs and the butter at the same temp, they emulsify really smoothly. So I'm gonna crack one at a time. I'm gonna beat the first one in before I add the second. This is just like straight cake making technique. Creaming, add the eggs, add the vanilla, alternate the wet and dry. Super straightforward. These are our chicken eggs. Look at that yolk. It's positively fluorescent. What are you feeding them? Actually, Harris is adding to their feed. First of all, they free range. I'm very Down proud of pizza. <laughs> Cow. They don't have to know that. We free range them, but Harris has been adding freeze dried bits of red pepper, like bell pepper, into their feed to try to enhance the yolk color. But I have to say, even before we started doing that, we had very orange yolks. If Harris goes out there with a bag of anything, they follow him around. Yeah. So I added my eggs. I'm gonna add my vanilla extract. So just two teaspoons. Close enough. The final piece of putting together the batter is to add my wet and dry ingredients alternating. And you always begin and end with dry. So I'm gonna do three additions of dry and two additions of wet. My wet ingredient is just my buttermilk. It's a half cup, again, room temp. So I'm gonna add about a third of the dry. And at this point, you wanna only mix on low because I'm not trying to develop a lot of gluten. I'm using all-purpose flour, not cake flour, because the, the batter does need to have some structure to it so that it doesn't just totally like spread out like crazy. But we still wanna be gentle with it so that our cookies turn out tender. So I like to mix until I see just a little bit of flour remaining. Then I'm gonna add about half of the buttermilk. Okay. Again, you can totally do this in a stand mixer, just use the paddle the whole time. Half of the remaining dry, or a third of the total. The remaining wet. So I'm not adding a ton of liquid to this. Like I'm not making a liquidy cake batter. I'm making a cake batter that is still thick enough that it can hold its shape. So I'm not adding like a ton of liquid. It's just a half cup. So that's the remaining dry. And I'll mix this until mostly incorporated and then I like to finish by hand with a spatula just to get everything really evenly mixed. Here I have a thick but super light and fluffy batter dough hybrid. And I'm folding it with the spatula and making sure that I'm scraping the sides and really getting into the bottom and folding to make sure it's evenly mixed. What you don't want is like a part that's more buttery and has less of the dry ingredients worked in because that particular, like that dough is a cookie is gonna spread out a lot. So you want everything even. And now, because I want my black and white cookies to be really tender and have some staying power and to not stale really quickly, like I want a tender, you know, still like moist, not dry cake, this is a fairly soft batter at this point. And so what I wanna do is let it rest and chill a little bit so I can handle it more easily. So what I'm gonna do is portion it out. I'm gonna use my scoop, just like onto a plate or a parchment lined cheat tray is fine. Then we're gonna chill it and that's going to help that batter firm up so that I can roll it into nice spheres and that's gonna make 
the sort of most like evenly shaped round cookies. So I'm gonna start to portion. You don't have to have a scoop. I just call for two ounce portions, which is about a quarter cup. So you can definitely just use a quarter cup measure and like a you know a little spoon or spatula to scrape out the batter. You do not have to work them into any particular shape at this point. You just want to divide up the batter. So that's probably as full as I wanna make it. ran out of space. Is that allowed? Sure. Is there any rules? Yeah, it's allowed if I say it's allowed, Cal. Probably could use a bigger platter. But I have everything portioned out. I want to chill this for like 20 to 25 minutes just so that the batter has a chance to firm up. All of that butter that's in there that's room temp will chill, get a little bit hard, and I'll be able to form the cookies into spheres. So I'm going to stick them in the fridge. Oh, where is this going to go? Is that going to fit? I have those portion out pieces of dough on the plate, chilling in the fridge. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab six of them from the plate and then throw the rest in the fridge. So I'm just gonna bake six at a time. And so this process like takes a couple of batches, but it's easier to work with fewer and they spread. So I can't really fit more than six on a baking sheet at a time. So I'm just gonna grab six pieces of dough and I have a little bit of extra flour here, which helps to roll them out into spheres. They could probably chill a little bit longer because they're still pretty soft, but I should be able to work with these. And six. So hopefully these aren't too soft. Basically I'm gonna use some floured hands. I'm just gonna roll these into a sphere. If it's too soft to work with and you're just getting tons of sticking and it's like it's not even holding together, stick it back in the fridge. So I'm spacing them out on my baking sheet. You don't want to use too much flour because you don't want to dry out the surface of the dough. Try to use a light hand. You can tap off excess flour. So now I have my oven preheated. I am going to throw these in the oven just on that center rack and I want to flatten them slightly so that they're about three quarters of an inch tall. Not too much. And I want to bake them until the centers are matte and springy to the touch. And I might see just a little bit of golden around the edge, but they'll be very, very pale. So I don't want to put a lot of color on them. I just want to let them go until they're set because we want like a nice pale canvas for the icing. And while these are baking, make sure that you have your remaining pieces of dough still chilling. And it's a good idea to cover them so they don't dry out in the fridge. Watch out, kitty cat. You gotta watch out. You gotta watch out, kitty cat. There you go. There's my timer. So this is my second batch. See, I have six already done right here. I just took these from the oven. I wanna show you a little trick that I have for if you're baking cookies, really any kind of like small round thing for making it really, really circular, which these are mostly circular, but like a little bit irregular. So what you can do while it's still really, really hot take a large circular cutter, you could do like a large water glass, anything that has you know, a big enough diameter to fit around the object or the cookie, put it over it on the baking sheet and like give it a little, make little circular motions. These have been sitting for a minute, so they're not quite hot enough to like take the shape. But for something like a really buttery cookie where it comes out of the oven really soft, this is a great tool for making something like perfectly round. So. Just set it over top, make sure you're not cutting off any of the edges. Give it like a little shake. I wanna let these cool, but I'm gonna go ahead and put together the icing because I can start to put that first layer of icing on my first batch. You just wanna let them cool on the baking sheet long enough that when you turn them over to cool fully on the baking rack, you're not like getting really deep grooves because it's really soft. So these have cooled completely. They're like super tender. They have just sort of a little golden color on the bottom and these are ready to be iced. This recipe is actually a variation on the blue and white cookies in the book. So I'm doing the chocolate version. So I have no lemon juice and said I have milk. So two tablespoons milk, two tablespoons of corn syrup, some vanilla extract, a little bit of salt. And then later on, I'm gonna show you why I'm doing it this way. I'm gonna add the cocoa powder. So let me just set this aside. You will also need two tablespoons of boiling water. That's kind of important. My confectioner sugar or powdered sugar is in this bowl. If your sugar has been sitting around for a long time and it's really lumpy, you might want to sift it, but I generally don't have a problem getting any lumps out of sugar just from whisking. 
So I'm gonna add that milk. Again, if you're doing the version in the book, this would be lemon juice. Then I'm gonna add the corn syrup. The corn syrup helps to give the icing like a really, really smooth texture and also makes it pretty glossy, which you want. And I'm gonna add my teaspoon of vanilla extract, a pinch of salt. That little pinch of salt helps to kind of temper the sweetness a little bit. Now I'm gonna add two tablespoons of boiling water. So I have my kettle right here. Oh, oop, well, that came out faster than I thought. Okay, so two tablespoons of boiling water. Now I wanna start to whisk everything. And with confectioner sugar, you don't wanna like go really hard at the very beginning. You wanna just go gently, get everything incorporated. And I like to weigh my powdered sugar and really carefully measure my liquid because I wanna get that consistent texture every single time. I was gonna say I wanna get that consistent consistency, but that doesn't really make sense. You want it to be thick because you want it to give a nice, generous coating to the cookie, but you want it to be thin enough that it's gonna like settle and dry really smooth. So you might have to make some small adjustments. I actually think this is a really good texture. It's pourable, but it's still kind of thick and ribbony. So now that I have my vanilla, I'm not gonna make the chocolate. I'm gonna just go with all vanilla for now and do a vanilla half on every single cookie that I have. Definitely the best tool for this is your small offset spatula. So what I like to do is I take one cookie at a time and I like to draw up some of the icing with the spatula. And as it runs down, I like to form a line down the middle of the cookie. You can really ice these in any way you want. The, the important thing is that you're icing half of it at a time. So I like to take that line and let it kind of run straight down the middle of the cookie. And then I can take the icing, just kind of go around the edge and fill it in. You can go as thick or as thin as you like. You don't want to go too thick because you don't want to add like so much sugar and sweetness to the cookie, but you want just enough to really give it like a nice opaque layer. Just like that, it looks great. And then you're gonna set it back on the baking sheet and just go one by one. So see how I'm drawing up the icing, letting that line kind of form stripe down the middle of the cookie and I kind of go in on the edge. If you find that the icing is running off the edge of the cookie, that means it's a little bit thin. So you want to add a little bit more powdered sugar. And if you find that it's too thick, add tap water to thin it out, but add it in really small increments. I like to just go like a half teaspoon at a time because a little bit actually goes a long way. I'm going to go ahead and ice all of my cookies, the ones here and also the ones on my baking sheet once they're cool. And then I'm going to show you how to do the chocolate half. So now I'm ready to make the chocolate icing and I'm just using the vanilla and adding cocoa powder to it. So it's like a nice sort of streamlined way to do it. You don't need two separate bowls. You can really add cocoa to taste, it's up to you. But I have two tablespoons here, so this is what I'm gonna start with. And I will have to add a little bit of extra water to thin it out because that cocoa is gonna tighten up the texture. So in this goes, again, if you have really lumpy cocoa powder, which sometimes happens because it's so fine, go ahead and sift it beforehand. If you really want like a really, dark icing, you can use something called black cocoa, which is like a super alkaline cocoa that will make a very, very dark, basically nearly black color. You can use tap water to thin it out. You don't need the boiling water. So I'm gonna add maybe a half teaspoon. Let's see what that does. Cocoa, I think is a better tool than like melted chocolate because there's no sugar added. So having that chocolate, that cocoa, as a bitter counterpoint to the sugar, I think is really important. I'm gonna add maybe just a smidge more cocoa. I do recommend using a Dutch processed cocoa. It's not important for like the chemistry of the recipe at all. It's just gonna give you a deeper flavor and a darker color. That was probably an extra half tablespoon. I don't think it needed it, but I just wanted it for the extra color and flavor. So I'm gonna add another little bit of water. This color and texture looks good to me. So let's do that test where is it gonna fluidly fall off the whisk, but still give a little bit of a ribbon on the surface. I think we're good. You'll also know that if you kind of give it a stir and let it sit, watch the surface of the icing, it should kind of settle down into a flat layer. I think that you would have to add so much of like, you know, the kind of cocoa you can buy in the grocery store, you'd have to add an exorbitant amount and it's just gonna throw off the texture. So for that really dark color, go with black cocoa, but I don't think it's necessary. If you're drying up and you're not getting a long fluid line, you might want to add a little bit more liquid. I mean, the black of my cookie is still, it's not black. It's, it's brown. The black and white cookie on Wikipedia is 
Let me see. I thought you'd never ask. There is black food coloring, though. I will say that that's a thing. Maybe it's squid ink. It's, ew, squid ink. No, thank you, please. Okay. So now I'm going to go back in, and I'm going to use that exact same icing technique that I used for the vanilla with the chocolate. And just handle them carefully because you don't want to, like, squeeze the cookie because you might crack that smooth finish of the vanilla. When I draw up with the spatula, I get, like, a nice long line. So now I think this is the perfect texture for the second half of the icing. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and do the second half of the remaining cookies, all with that chocolate. Chocolate layer of icing, layer of chocolate icing. So I'm just kind of following that line that I laid before. What happens if you mess one up? Scrape it all off? Yeah, you can, you can basically scrape it off. Especially, it's easier with the vanilla because it won't like color the cookie at all. If you did one that was all white, could you do like drops of the chocolate and just a little? Uh, yeah, but you'd have to do that before the icing sets. So I maybe missed my window. If you get any drips, just scrape them off. You don't like the drips? I don't love the drips. So I went ahead and finished the chocolate side. These had time to set. The icing is still really, really glossy, even though it's drying. And that's what you get from adding just that little bit of corn syrup. It looks super glossy and appealing and pretty and like has a, that beautiful smooth finish. These stale quickly. So it is the kind of thing where you, you really ideally want to eat them the day that they're made. And they'll keep in an airtight container just at room temperature, but definitely the day they're made is when they're optimal. So I'm going to break one apart. You can see they're so like soft and fluffy on the inside. They're not hard. They're not dry at all. I really feel like the best black and white cookie is when you make it home. So I'm going to taste. I kind of like to get a bite that gets a little bit of chocolate and a little bit of vanilla. Mmm. So tender, so fluffy. Mm, you get kind of that scent of vanilla from the cake. It's just really good. Delish. Mm. Mm. Weren't people saying more cow? Yeah, more cow. <laughs> it needs milk, doesn't it? Who would, who would be good with milk? Or do you want iced coffee with it? How much have you had today? Seven or eight cups. <laughs> like seven or eight cups of coffee. It tastes like a cupcake. Yeah, it's very cakey. Mm. And not dry. It's good. It's good, right? Mm -hmm. How does it compare to the ones that you have at a, at a bakery that have been sitting there for 48 <laughs> hours? I, I've had enough bad black and white cookies that I just see them and I don't even buy. I wouldn't even, yeah. wouldn't even eat one. They're very kid friendly. Though. Right? You could eat this. You could definitely eat more than one without even thinking about it and then realize you just had like a ton of sugar. I, Not yeah. a ton, but you know what I mean. So this is my classic New York black and white cookie. In the book, I have a little bit of a spin on it. It's my blue and white that are like lemon and blueberry, a great variation. It's a really fun cookie to make. Is it cake? Is it cookie? Does it matter? I think it's cake. Thank you so much for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe. Cut.